Top Med Talk. Welcome along to Top Med Talk. My name is Nick Majerison and I am the senior producer of this podcast. I'm at Ed Pom 20. 22. It's an exciting atmosphere here. A lot of incredible conversations have been taking place on the main stage. I've been here at the Top Med Talk booth and I've bumped into Adam Bieberjohn. He's a UCL Perioperative Medicine Fellow. Adam, thanks for joining us. What do you make of EBPOM 2022 so far? Well, it's been great. Uh, I think one of the nicest things to see in EPOM is people actually coming together and nice to be doing it in person rather than just through a team screen as something that's really lost when you're just doing it over a computer. So it's been such an amazing, like an electric atmosphere. And all the talks have been great, really stimulating some great discussions. And yeah, it's been nice to be a part of it. Yeah, in the post-COVID world as well, here we are. I know, I know. It almost feels like a luxury to be meeting people face-to-face, It's uh, especially in London, without any masks on. I mean, it almost feels dystopian to having, having that. Interesting time as well in terms of the history of perioperative medicine. In the time I've been working at Top Med Talk, I've never seen more people become more electrified or excited about what this is, perioperative medicine, because you can get people through the process now more than ever. It's something that's needed, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. As you mentioned, I'm one of the perioperative medicine fellows here at UCL. And one of the really nice parts is we've been able to open a PACU and try and create a green pathway where patients have been shielding can have their cancer surgeries which has been a big stressor for them when during surgery when all the surgery stopped during the sort of the, the pandemic and we had some really big surges here um, and to be able to watch these patients come in have their surgery and walk out cancer free or at least you know get this get through the surgery and take the next step in their treatment it's been absolutely fantastic so yeah and never thought any of us would live through something like this but it's nice to be looking at the hopefully a bit of a brighter future now. So I've been told that perioptive medicine practitioners are uniquely placed to lead us forward away from the difficulties of COVID and also as we live with COVID. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Um, it's always, that's, that's a really interesting challenge. And I think looking at, um, looking at perioperative medicine, I think we, we can play a role. I think that this is going to be much bigger than just perioperative medicine. But I think that perioperative medicine will play a really important role in helping to optimize these patients at the beginning of their, their journey from the diagnosis all the way through their inpatient treatment and hopefully helping to relieve some of the pressure on primary care, which, as we all know, is always overburdened, not just in the UK, but that's a global issue as well. I mean, would, would you say that now... Would you say now that perioperative medicine is starting to be appreciated uh, and is something that may start to become, as you say, standard of care? Uh, I mean, I'm a complete convert. So let me, let, me put, let me lay my cards on the table. I was the biggest perioperative medicine cynic. Um, I joined EPOM uh, in 2020 when it was free online. And I was a cynic, listening to everything. I thought, well, that's all really basic. We already do that. What are you talking about? Then I decided to try and find out a bit more. And I started doing this fellowship, the Perioperative Medicine Fellowship here. And looking at, listening to people who are experts in the field and being involved from prehab, which is my main focus, looking at patients, how we can get them involved in their own treatment, let them take ownership of that treatment and drive their treatment forward. I've got to say, I'm a complete convert to perioperative medicine now. Um, I think that the problem with perioperative medicine is that because it's such a nebulous term, it's very hard to pin down. Like, an, like you could say, I'm an anaesthetist or I'm an orthopedic surgeon. You can nail down exactly what that is. As a perioperative physician, it can encompass many people, geriatricians, medics, surgeons, anaesthetists, intensivists. Um, to nail down exactly what that is is very difficult. We may not have done the best selling of that in the earlier years, but I think now... A lot of surgeons, definitely my colleagues here, they've seen the benefit of this. And they are, they, again, we're starting to get more and more people being converted to, the, to our cause. Now, certainly here on Top Med Talk, prehabilitation has been one of the words, the buzzwords of the last few years. Uh, there's been some major developments in that area. Do you want to speak to that? What do you think are the big changing shapes uh, in prehabilitation at the moment? Well, I think um, it's, it's, you know, there's so many experts here. And yesterday we had some incredible talks. Um, if you are listening and can look, access them, I'd highly recommend it. Guys out of Manchester, guys out of South Tees that are making a beautiful blended approach for using existing facilities like existing gyms 
uh, getting people out of the house and into the gym settings and combining that with now the advent of digital technology um, is, is incredible. But actually, what is prehab really doing is it's encompassing very simple things. We've all known for years, exercise is really important. Everyone's told you from when you were a kid in school, you've got to exercise, do your PE, go exercise. You all know you've got to eat healthy. We may not know exactly what that means, but we all know that we're supposed to eat healthy. But now we're trying to take that a little bit further and say, what exercise do you need to do? How can we make this accessible to you? What do you need? What should you be eating? And how can we make that accessible to you? But finally, the last bit, which I think COVID, one of the one of the good parts, if if I can call it that, is we think we consider mental health as significantly as a significantly higher priority than maybe we did before because we know that if a patient's just mentally not quite there or, quite, or feeling fragile or just doesn't quite understand or is scared, which is understandable, if we can approach that and try and help them through that and know that they've got someone to do that, they're more likely to be able to engage with whatever we need them to do and they can see the benefit from that. Now you bring me over to the next question here. On that, how much of a hard sell is prehabilitation to a member of the public nowadays? Have things changed or do they still kind of feel like you want granny to uh, do an assault course before she uh, goes under the knife? Um, again, there's always a gap between us sitting here in Epom and all buying in and we all drink the Kool-Aid and getting it out to everybody out there. That's, we've got to be the ambassadors for that. And that's how we put it across. Um, there's been a lot of talk about diversity um, and about the varying approaches and the varying people that can put this across. And what's nice, again, in the environment that I'm working in is that we have physios, we have nurses, we have doctors, psychologists, um, exercise therapists, all of us with our own skill set, all of us with our own background. So we try and see whenever we're trying to talk to people, we try and see who can connect to that audience the best. And we take a group of us to go and talk to them. Sometimes, and you'll see that like sometimes I'll get across to that group um, as, a, you know, as a, I came from a working class background. So when I talk about, when I speak to a lot of working class people, they sort of understand my background and therefore will maybe take it a bit better from me than someone who may not have that similar background. So now hearing it, I'm hoping that we can start to change the conversation a little bit to something that is beneficial and not, like you say, not an assault course because people just hear high intensity interval training and they think of just the CrossFit guys that are on TV or doing gladiators or something like that. It's like, that's just not what it is at all. And um, you could, the simplest interventions for five, 10 minutes a day can make all the difference nowadays yeah a data driven approach shows you that doesn't it it really does absolutely and, and and that's another issue that we've always had in the past is like do we have any good quality data well that question is now being answered the guys out of manchester produced reduced length of stay and that's a really difficult thing considering how many potential things can go wrong during a hospital admission that's got nothing to do with prehab you know um but they've managed to demonstrate a reduced length of stay i mean that's just a phenomenal achievement and that's a cost-saving benefit so we can say that the patients love it the the people who hold all the all the money in the nhs or in the finance system they love it what's not to like um and there's a reason why this has become a hot topic is because we've now can demonstrate that it's working um and again with digital media I've just been, I've just kept my eye open. I've been doing it all week. I've been watching everybody who's walking past my corridor right now and everyone's got, had a digital phone in their hand or a Fitbit or, so, or equivalent on their wrist. So, you know, and this is, or have been a mixed crowd of uh, young people graduating here today mm -hmm. <laughs> at the university and elderly people that are walking past. Everyone's had a digital device. If they've all got that in their hand, why can't we tap into that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you mentioned the diversity of perioperative medicine. It's a huge field of study. What area do you think you would like more people to spend more time on? Oh, that's a really great question. Personally, um, I, what I really love, the main things I love about perioperative medicine is doing the simple things well. My greatest, what I would love to see is how to get people who have a specific skill set or a specific diversity or a specific ability to communicate with people get them to engage with people who are not accessing healthcare well let me give you an example 
we have in, in our catchment area here a lot of very deprived communities who don't necessarily speak English as a first language, who have got sort of very deep-rooted cultural aspects which may not be of the healthiest in terms of nutrition or food consumption or lifestyle. But we've got a very diverse workforce. But we don't access and use that workforce to help drive these messages forward. As I was mentioning, it may be better, people may listen to me, and I know for the COVID vaccine, in my, back in my own community, they were worried about having pork or beef uh, constituents in the COVID vaccine and therefore Hindus, Muslims would not necessarily take the vaccine. That was something that was in my own community back in Leicestershire. And I went back and I was talking to them. I was like, no, that's not the case. It's all synthetic. But they didn't know. It was, it was bad information that's been passed around or wives' tales and rumours. So I was saying, Let, we've got a diverse workforce. Let's take, make use of them. Make, let's make use of all these people and get them out into the community and talking and you know what I get much greater joy talking to people about their own health care um, and not going there and you know under educating let me go and teach you how to do this very paternalistic I just want to have a conversation let's have a conversation about your health care what's the biggest and ask them what's the biggest problem oh I'm, I'm really worried about how long it takes me to go get my hip done I was like have you considered that actually now if you're waiting for a year you've got a whole year to try and s- get your health a bit better people never thought about that because I never thought about that up until a few years ago until I knew a bit more about perioperative medicine and I work in the field so you know when it comes to diversity I'd love to just take all of our expertise which is going to cost us nothing because we already got we already employ them in a hospital it costs us nothing and get them out into the community and get get a better engagement for the community I, f- I feel that that's that's got to be the next step for us and then what area do you find of perioperative medicine as someone who studies it is a challenge for you. You're, you're an advocate, we're, we're all on board, yeah. but what would you say was a challenge? Um, the challenge? The challenge is sometimes to have a coherent message. And for me, that sometimes is quite difficult. We literally just walked out of um, a lecture and a plenary session called The Great Fluid Debate. And we had some wonderful talkers, you know, the experts in the field who have pretty much produced the evidence base. But 20 years later... I walked out and I still can tell you what's the best fluid we should give for someone who's hypotensive three days after admission, you know? So then you've got people's opinions and we all know that people's opinions can be quite varying, can be quite polarizing. And sometimes that does shut down the conversation. So what I would like is, you know, for us to try and create these wonderful guidelines, but try and create very clear, very coherent points to move forward this is what we need this is the target you know for a transfusion threshold it's you know we will not transfuse above 70 unless there is a clear clinical indication not oh well you could do this or you could do that you know we've got an ev- we've started to produce an evidence base we now need to create the clear direction and I'd, I, that, that's why I would where I see our greatest challenge but also I see the greatest potential for growth in perioperative medicine yeah I mean in it makes me the fluid debate happens every year and it's, it's always interesting restricted versus yeah. liberal and what those words mean indeed but I wonder new paradigm things go forward in the way that we would like them to go uh, how would how would you see perioptive practitioners uh, approaching that kind of debate and then the wider angle of uh, uh, operations in general um in this new world, once it's all once it's all working out exactly as we want it to. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, many 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 things have to go right. I think I'm a big data nerd when it comes down to it, and I, I think that data does drive innovation. Data does drive change because you can't argue sometimes with numbers. I I argue maybe sometimes the statisticians could, but I think that if you've got some solid numbers, you've got some solid proof, then all of a sudden the debate changes from which is the right to how do we implement this strategy Um, going forward I think that the use of making use of people's things like people's wearables and that sort of thing it's like for me that's how we move this debate forward so let's let's take fluids for example I know there's a lot of research coming out and I know um, I don't want to spoil anybody's fun there's a lot of research coming out in uh, very soon about that but use of you know, when do we start using catecholamines versus when do we give a fluid bolus? Do we start using them on the wards instead of getting fluid? Do we, tar- do we have to target this from medical school and nursing school? You know, do we try and teach this as an ingrained part? I think perioperative medicine, as we mentioned right from the top, is such a 
wide and varied field with so many specialties involved it would be remiss if we sort of as anaesthetists that they're thinking well we know fluids really well in the- in theater fyi spoiler we don't but we think we do it in thing but you know what about the surgical sho that's sitting on the ward who's now the nurse has told us oh the blood pressure is 80 over 60 they can only give a fluid bonus they've got literally nothing else in their back pocket they can call they can call me and I, my intensive care is full their blood pressure is still all right i'm going to tell them give a fluid bonus because there's nothing else they can do there's nothing else i can do so if i you know that's where i'd love to about you know things like wearables using wearables you know can that we can measure an ecg we can measure sats through wearables eventually that technology is going to start being able to measure body composition i think you can all go to the gym and have my total body water measured just by holding two things or standing on a smart scale it's coming the technological revolution is coming and what i'd love to see is us rather than shy away and adopt it very slowly actually jump straight in and say right what can you do for us let's have a talk to these companies and say right we want to measure this how can you help me do that and then I wonder, for someone who's listening to us speaking now, who's considering making the trip down to EBPOM, I mean, Top Med Talk gets a huge audience and, you know, uh, obviously not all of them can come along, but some of them will be thinking about it. What tips would you give them uh, if they were coming on to an EBPOM or an EBPOM-themed event? My best tip that I could give you is come with an open mind because I came in sitting here, again, I can talk about the fluid one because I literally just came out of that one. I came in thinking... I wonder what you could possibly tell me. And in that talk, I went through a whole range of opinions of, yeah, I really like that. Oh, wait, uh, what What did you mean by that? To coming out as like, actually, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. The first lecture today was, I know nothing, um, which was possibly one of the best talks I've ever heard because it started off as, I know nothing. I was like, okay, I'm willing to entertain that. He went through some of the most detailed science I've heard in a long time. And then it came back to I know nothing. And actually the reality was it, of it was maybe I do not know nothing. And maybe that's where it resets how I start approaching my problems and approaching my research. And that was absolutely fascinating. So I think that you will learn things, that, things about the state of the art and how we're moving in perioperative medicine. But I think the most fun parts is there'll be some talks that completely challenge how you're the established thinking or your personal established thinking and if you can come with an open mind that's the best advice i could ever give you now correct me if i'm wrong i think that was hugh montgomery was hugh it? montgomery yes that's yeah. I, was, I knew it was hugh i couldn't remember his last that's name right. hugh, hugh montgomery, montgomery. brilliant Excellent. talk yeah talks from him on top med talk if you check out the links in the show notes you'll be able to find those and the talk you're mentioning adam will be putting out at a future date listen thanks for joining it's been really great to chat to you that's been a pleasure uh, any final words that you would like to leave us with i didn't know about top med talk until this one i've went and i've downloaded the podcast there's a lot of them so it's a really fun really fun podcast and i've learned a lot already in just two days of knowing about many, it many many months of audio there. absolutely i can't wait <laughs> lovely great to have you on board and thanks for joining us thank all you. the best with your uh, perioperative medicine fellowship thank you top med talk thanks for downloading top med talk Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organising around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home home. Check out ebpom.org now.